Hey, hey everybody, it's Overkill here with another Warhammer Faction video. So today we're looking at another future Warhammer Faction, the Skaven. So, thank you all again for watching. Um, I got a comment on, uh, not the last episode, but the Chaos one, I believe, where someone told me to write a script. Now, I do write notes, um, quite extensive notes as well, especially for this one. Um, it's going to be quite a read. But that's not what exactly what, this video is, what these videos are about. Like, he's saying, write a script for everything that I want to say. Now, that's not quite what it is. I write script and jot notes, basically, where I would like to get an idea of what I'm going to say and then make not a discussion, of course, because you guys can't talk back, but it, but say it to you guys in a discussion form. Now, I edit out some of my stutters and my mmm and, my, re and uh, my thinking where I'm just like silent for a few moments. I edit all that stuff out to make it more streamlined and you guys like that these warhammer videos are the most popular videos some of them are my most popular videos on the channel um which is crazy thank you all so much for watching of course but um that's not quite what i'm going for i'm not this is not 100 percent the information you need for warhammer that's not what i'm putting these videos out on at eh, putting these out as at all this is videos that you can listen to and get to a better understanding of the Warhammer factions, this is not the videos that's going to give you everything. I am not going into detail nearly as much as the factions deserve. These are literally what you need to know for war, for Total War, basically. Not even some things aren't even um, even as in depth as they could be, but it's just that in depth. It's just an idea for people to listen to. Um, I've got a lot of people saying thank you, like thank you. I listen to this while I'm working on something or something. That's what these are for, just for the general information. Now we've already rambled on long enough. This is not about <laughs> none of this stuff is about Skaven, so let's get into that. So. First off, of course, with the characteristics, but thank you for your comment. I'm not trying to call you out or anything. I like, thank you for, you know, trying to make the videos better, but sadly, that's just not what this is. I can't make a script that goes on for 30 minutes or more, basically. But anyway, the characteristics. The Skaven are the literal meaning of the swarm army of Warhammer. There's hundreds of models. People, depending on the unit they use, there's hundreds of unit, uh, hundreds of models in a unit, which for the tabletop is quite a lot. Um, so you can imagine in Total War, some of their units are going to have more men than others, even more than goblins, or they should at least. They might not. They might not do it for balance reasons, of course. Don't mind that. But they are the swarm. Even in Warhammer, they usually have the most models of any army. There's that. And that brings us into the second count, which is the highest man count in Warhammer, usually. Um, in terms of the race and the lore, they have the most of any faction, maybe like, ar arguably against uh, orcs, because no one really knows how many orcs there are. But again, no one knows how many Skaven there are either, so it's up for debate, basically. But it's probably safe to say that the Skaven have the most. But, yeah. Uh, the Skaven army consists of tons and tons of infantry, backed by small amounts of elite infantry, powerful monsters, and devastating war machines. We'll get to those as we go down to the uh, military, or the roster, that is. They are the most ruthless race in Warhammer, more so even than Chaos, as a lot of people would like to say, as most most figures in the in Chaos can respect each other to a certain degree, whereas in the Skaven society, everyone hates each other more on that later. There are lower units, that being the non-elite and even the just normal, uh, even the normal infantry, are very cowardly. Um, so don't expect high morale from the Skaven, that is for sure. They are rat men, so you can imagine that they are very, very cowardly, and they're very superstitious, afraid of everything, stuff like that. They're a very unstable faction, so civil war is going to be a certainty at least once, or maybe even, I don't even know, dozens of times. You're going to be dealing with uprisings all the time as the Skaven. Um, they don't like each other at all. There is no, there's no unity nearly at all. But anyway, all Skaven reside underground in the Under Empire, which spans the entire continent of the Old World, and Skaven even live in the other continents such as the New World and such. So they're definitely one of the most spread out factions in Warhammer, so that's going to be interesting once they are added in. Now the final characteristic is the are, uh, they are led by the Council of Thirteen. So the Skaven are led by the Council of Thirteen, eleven seats are held by Warlords, and one seat is held by a seer lord, the thirteenth seat is held for the great horned rat, the Skaven God. So we talked about characteristics, now let's get into geography if you can really call it that. The Skaven live in the Under Empire, known, sometimes known as Skavendom. 
It is the name given to a massive intercontinental underground empire that holds uncountable miles of tunnels and passageways that stretch from the ice-capped mountains of the north to the damp swamplands of the south, and from the great plains of the east to the lush jungles of the west. The great city of Skavenblight acts as, one of the, uh, as the one true capital of the Skaven race, and as such, it is also situated at the very heart of the Under Empire. Most of the vast territory that make up the Under Empire are usually held by the larger and stronger of the Skaven clans, with the smaller clan having only a territory of a few mere miles, usually at a backwater region of the Under Empire. Most major Skaven strongholds or cities are usually within the vicinity of a larger population center, like the cities of the Great Clan Empire, which are just the, uh, the human empire. These cities were built for either the purpose as a staging point for an upcoming invasion or th of the supposed city, or rather a city that has grown fat and prosperous by the wealth these cities throw away. All the Skaven holds are linked together by a great underway which was built by the dwarves that were abandoned. This gives nearly free access to the dwarf Karaks, although many entrances to the underway have been collapsed by the dwarves just for this reason. We've seen the underway in the ambush at the Thundering Falls, that's what that tunnel is that they're going through. The capital of this Under Empire is Skavenblight, as mentioned earlier, a former human city located within the land of Tilia. Many of the great Skaven holds are built into craters that were created by meteors of Warpstone. Warpstone is the material with which Skaven survive off of. It is their currency, a material particularly wealthy warlords will wear in armor or as jewelry, a source of power for their empire and war machines, and even a material used in mutation and creation of beasts. A quick note, Warpstone is literally solid chaos energy. As the lures of magic were created by chaos energy, Warpstone is seen as the ultimate physical manifestation of pure magic. Some of the greatest holds from mentioned earlier are Under Altdorf, Hell Pit, the Black Chasm, Crookback Mountain, and the City of Pillars, which was formerly Karak Eight Peaks, basically the second greatest hold of the dwarfs. Now we move into government. Uh, the Skaven are ruled by the Council of Thirteen. These rat lords of the Skaven race oversee all matters pertaining to the entire species, from hatching terrible plots to initiating an invasion against the enemies of their kind. Within the tyrannical hierarchy of the Under Empire, the Council of Thirteen consists of the warlords of the four great clans as well as seven other lesser warlords. It is considered the right and sovereign duty of the Council of Thirteen to unite the various greater and lesser clans under a single banner. While the council holds sway over the entirety of the Under Empire, the reality of a unified Skaven nation has yet to be fully realized. If it were not for the constant squabbling between the various Skaven clans, the Great Ascendancy would have occurred millennia ago. Instead, infighting and bickering hold the Skaven back, much to the benefit of the Old World. The Council of Thirteen gathers in whole or in part, at least once a month, and sessions are occasionally called on a weekly basis, especially in times of war. The council members discuss battle plans, political dilemmas, and important issues that face their race, and must vote on what course of action needs to be taken. Politics also play an important part in the council's discussion, and alliances are often made or broken in full view of the other members. The unity of the council remains at, at its core an illusion. Only when the issue is of the most dire, or when the horned rat personally intervenes is the, in the decision-making, will the council ever unite under a single cause. The Skaven society is often divided between two systems, the caste system and a clan hierarchy. The caste system is based on fur color, which sets certain Skaven into specific roles. White and gray fur Skaven are considered the chosen of the great horned rat, being represented as the priests or religious caste of the Under Empire. Black fur denotes the warrior caste. On certain cases, a Skaven who does not possess black fur can still join, should he prove just as an effective warrior as any other black furred Skaven. Brown fur denotes the rest of the Skaven society, making them the most diverse in terms of profession, quality of life, and social status. Being outside of the caste system, the brown furred Skaven are often divided further into certain, into certain sects that focus on professions such as trading, building, and the crafting of weapons and goods. All of these groupings allow the Skaven to apply their urge for social climbing on a much larger scale each sect battling for supremacy over the other. Just as each Skaven battles for supremacy within his sect, outright warfare between these groups are not as common as many would think, simply because the priest caste often moderates hostilities between factions by use of terror and cruelty. In their case, the priest caste wants to ensure for full control over the Under Empire, and without some form of union, the Under Empire as a whole cannot truly exist. Outside of the caste system, Skaven society is usually dominated by a treacherous clan-based hierarchy, from which clans of warlords make up the bulk of their ever-growing population of male ratmen. 
These militaristic clans, known as warlord clans, form a hierarchy defined by the law of the strongest ruling over the weakest. At the top of this hierarchy is the warlord, hence its name, who is supposed to be the strongest and most cunning individual within the entire clan. These warlords are, are the official and tyrannical rulers of the Skaven clans, whose rule is both harsh and absolute. Below the warlord is also the warrior caste, which is expected, composed of Blackford Skaven trained as elite warriors. As befit their prestigious position, these Skaven are given the best that the clan has to offer, which often includes adequate and regular meals, his own personal lodging, the best weapons and armor, and the rights to breed with the clan's female Skaven. At the base of this pyramid hierarchy, the foundation of which all society is built around is the working class, the insignificant and expendable slaves or workers. Slaves and workers can be of varying races or culture and are often prisoners of war or members of a rival clan that has since been subjugated into submission. Although they rarely admit it, nearly all Skaven view all clanmates as potential enemies. Skaven who occupy positions of power or authority are envied for their power, while those ratmen who served in the lesser roles are constantly suspected of treachery. The daily clan life of the Skaven is often marked by continuous fights and power struggles for supremacy. A Skaven's life is a lawless and miserable world where the weak are killed and the strong survive, provided they constantly watch their backs against rivals. Clans growing too fast or too slow will eventually lead to inter-rivalries, which would be the result of a warlord not exerting enough authority to his subordinates. This would this would eventually lead to small-scale civil war between small factions within the clan. Of the many diverse clans that, in that engulf much of the Under Empire, there are none so powerful both militarily, politically, and influentially as the four great clans. These ancient clans consist of the warlock engineers of Clan Skyrer, the fanatical plague monks of P Clan Pestilin, the assassin adepts of Clan Eshin, and the mutated war beasts of Clan Mulder. These clans hold the greatest occupation within the Under Empire and whose wealth, power, and influence has the potential to change the political and social landscape of the Under Empire in a whim. Their power extends so much so that the leaders of each clan occupies a seat within the Council of Thirteen. Now under these four clans there are tons and tons of other clans, but two of the biggest ones would be Moors and Rictus who also holds seats on the Council of Thirteen. So now we move on to religion. Now, the Horned Rat is the supreme god of the Skaven, and he brokes no other gods before him. Though not affiliated with the Lords of Chaos, the Horned Rat is certainly a distant relative of those foul beings. He represents all things the Skaven are or wish to be. Undying and eternally scheming, this cunning deity patiently awaits the day of the Great Ascendancy, when his children will swarm across the face of the world, devouring it from within. All things must rot, figuratively or literally, and the Horned Rat and his offspring are the worldly reality of the simple truth. Blood sacrifice is common in the day-to-day -day worship of the Horned Rat. The, sc the Skaven fear that if the Horned Rat's appetite is not satisfied, he will devour his children instead. The form of, a of the sacrifice, a slave, Skaven or otherwise, is not as important as the sacrifice itself. There is no specific doctrine that governs who or what must be sacrificed. The sacrifice itself is enough to sate the Lord of Decay for a brief time. Young victims are considered to be the most potent sacrifices for the Horned Rat, while the blood of the aged and infirm is less desirable. In times of war, the number of daily blood sacrifices can be staggering, sometimes numbering in the thousands in the great Skaven cities of Skaven Blight or Hell Pit. The Skaven also increase the number of daily sacrifices if they fail to secure victory in battle, or suffer some other embarrassing setback. The Grey Seers preach that victory cannot be won if the Horned Rat is, uns is unsatisfied with his minions, and thus any defeat or failure is a sign that he must be appeased. Religious services are constantly held by the Grey Seers in honor of their sinister god. All Skaven are expected to be present at Mass at least once a day, even though no formal records of attendance are kept. Those who do not attend services open themselves up to all manner of criticism, including accusations of heresy, treason, and atheism. Influential Skaven warlords contract their own spiritual advisors from the ranks of Grey Seers, and these priests for hire give private services to their employers and their households. So you can see that the Skaven are a very religious lot, um, almost more so than the other factions of Warhammer. So with that out of the way, we now move on to the roster. Now I have created a roster here, as you can see, and we are going to go down through it. So. For our legendary lords, now, this was a very, very, very challenging thing to choose. Now, a lot of people who are very into the Skaven lore may disagree. Actually, not even disagree. I'm not setting a opinion or anything. Um, it's just that looking down through the characters, the two that make sense to me and would just ap appeal as legendary lords to me are Thankwell and Ikit Claw. Now, we'll go into more detail there but uh, later, but there's a bunch of 
uh, characters that the Skaven could have, but I thought Thanquil and Ikatclaw were either the most unique or the most influential, Thanquil being one of the biggest characters in Warhammer, basically, for the Skaven. Um, but yeah, we won't, we'll go into them later, but if you would like to add in another character, there are a bunch. There's Queek Headtaker, there's, there's, uh, Lord Skrulk, there's Throt the Unclean, uh, Snitch, Snitch, whatever. Um, there's a bunch, but either way, um, leave it down below what lord you would like to see for the Skaven. Of course, I'm not reading a real roster. Thankwell and Ikaclaw might not be legendary lords, I don't know. But either way, we're going to move on to the lord section now. For the first for the lords are the vermin lords, and the vermin lords are living icons of ruin, towering figures possessed of raw power and feral savagery. As avatars of the horn rat, they can call upon fail energies, manipulating the weak-willed into doing almost anything they will. So, these are going to be a melee and a caster kind of uh, kind of lord, and they're going to be very powerful, of course. They're akin to demon princes of chaos. Now, I didn't mention demon princes in my chaos warrior video because they're not in the roster and they're also not chaos warriors, they're a demon unit. But if you know anything about Warhammer, um, demon princes are and vermin lords are essentially one and the same. The vermin lords are basically the demon princes of uh, the horned rat, whereas the demon princes can be of Nurgle, of Korn, and all that stuff. So yeah, that's pretty cool. So we next have the Skaven Warlord. Now, um, Skaven Warlord, in battle, these brutal backstabbing commanders will do anything for victory. Leading from the back, a nice safe place where he can watch the flow of battle and decide where his sword arm is needed most. You can see they're not the bravest. Even in the Warlords, they're not that brave. Uh, we move on to Gracier's, and Gracier's are your Lord Caster. The Gracier's are powerful sorcerers capable of channeling eldritch energies into destructive ways, leveling armies with lightning or summoning raven ravening swarms of rats. As chief agents for the Horned Rat, Gracier's wield... Tremendous influence amongst the Warlord clans, and only a fool would ignore their counsel. So yeah, again, playing into the whole religious and magic thing is very important for the Skaven. Graciers are pretty much supreme. And on the Council of Thirteen specifically, the Seer Lord actually essentially gets two votes, because he usually acts as the translator between the Horn Rat and the other Skaven. So, yeah... So Graciers, uh, or Skaven rather, have their own lores. They have the Skaven spells of Ruin and or Plague. Now this is completely different from any other faction in Warhammer, as usually the other factions have access to the multiple lores, but the Skaven only have access to their own. So that's going to be quite interesting to see. So we then move on to heroes. So for heroes, we start with Warlock Engineers. Now, Warlock Engineers are the notorious engineers of Clan Skyre. And they are among the greatest minds in the entire Under Empire. These Tinker Rats are the artificers of Skaven society, blending arcane sorceries with mad science technology in the creation of one of the deadliest machines ever invented in the world. When not manning war machines or watching over the we a weapons team, the ordinary warlock engineer would naturally have the power to channel and cast magic in the traditional way as other races. So yeah, these guys are going to act as maybe a buff for artillery units, and of course on the battlefield they're going to act as wizards using the lore of death and ruin so that's going to be very interesting and of course yeah they're the creators of all the war machines that we are going to talk about later so next we have plague priests and a plague priest is another uh wizard for the skaven the rank of the plague priest is the highest obtainable rank within the clan the, w the ones higher than them are the plague lords the most senior of the plague priest a plague priest is a skaven who has a deep understanding of the foul magic their clan has harnessed over the ages and as such are capable ma magicians who can vomit geysers of lethal sub substances or curse their foes from afar, making them erupt in putrid boils. So these are going to be another caster who use the lore of plague or undeath. So that's going to be interesting once again. You can see that the Skaven are very magic focused. So the third we have Eshen Assassins. Eshen Assassins are capable of infiltrating virtually any fortress and eliminating any enemy. The Council of Thirteen regularly uses them to eliminate rebellious warlords and disloyal Seers. Their services are also sold to whoever may afford the price demanded by Clan Eshen. They are also capable of committing sabotage, like burning ships or houses, poisoning wells and or food supplies. Operating mostly alone, they are also capable of concealing themselves inside a regular Skaven infantry unit to better slay an enemy champion amidst the confusion of battle. So these guys, this description just relates them 100% to total war. So on the campaign map, they're going to be your, your typical spy, assassinating and poisoning things and sabotaging. And on the battlefield, they're going to be able to sneak around possibly have a hidden rule where maybe they're not noticed by the enemy or uh, until it's too late basically where they can then attempt to assassinate or get into like a, or deal a lot of damage to enemy characters it's going to be very interesting to see them 
So now we can move on to melee infantry. So first we have the Skaven Slaves. Now, although not officially considered a part of the army, the Slave Rats of many clans still play an important and vital role during the heat of battle. Their main purpose in the battlefield is to swarm headlong against the front of the enemy army, tiring or absorbing much of the fighting while the more proper soldiers of the clan rush in afterwards to support them. They would also do the menial task when not in the battlefield, which includes labor, mining, tunneling, or even in dire times becoming a reserve food supply for the Skaven army. So we're going to have a few options for them. They are going to come in units of hand weapons and shields, spears and shields. So basically we're going to have slaves, slaves with spears, and slingers. So this is going to be your basically only, not your only, this is going to be your cheapest uh, foot ranged unit. So that's going to be interesting. So next we have clan rats. Clan rats form the bulk of most Skaven armies. These warriors would naturally be considered nothing more than Skaven who have risen up to aid their clan during times of war. These troops are usually very lightly armored using a variety of weapons and armor scavenged or looted from many areas they have previously raided for goods and weapons. So these are going to come as Skaven or clan rats and clan rats with spears, of course. Next we have Plague Monks, the most common infantry fielded by Clan Pestilin. These group of fanatics are these groups of fanatics are utterly dedicated to spread their corruption within the enemy ranks. When they are near the enemy, the monks will go on a fanatical frenzy, killing their enemy with rusted swords and iron tipped staffs to infect those they hurt with unimaginable diseases. Due to their diseased bulk, plague monks can survive injuries that would normally kill an ordinary skaven. So next we have the plague sensor bearers, which a plague sensor is a hollow spiked metal ball attached to a lengthy chain meant to be used as a weapon by the plague sensors, which are just another unit of plague monks essentially. Within the hollow spike are lethal doses of warp stone and vile contagions that release a foul green cloud that will cause flesh to erupt into sores and fluid filled blisters. The sensor bearers are fanatical in combat, never faltering or retreating. They continue on their murderous rampage until each and every one of them are cut down. So these are going to be a very, very unbreakable, just crazy fanatic unit basically. So then we have Night Runners. The Night Runners are considered the rank and file soldiers of Clan Eshin, lightly armed and armored so as to take advantage of their tremendous speed and agility. The Night Runners excel at flanking maneuvers and lightning fast attacks. They cannot stand long against heavily armed or armored opponents and are best kept in reserve role in a reserved role unless no other course is available. Despite their limitations, they are often thrown into the fray as necessary and their lives sacrificed en masse. Nice. So these are going to be your first kind of flanky sneaky unit next you have gutter runners which are nimble and quick they would have to be to have survived their apprenticeship in the ranks of clan eshin's night runners they are elite skirmishers and scouts second only to eshin's assassins in the art of stealth and speed their attacks are quick and effective frustrating their enemies as the gutter runners appear attack and vanish just as quickly in a flash of smoke or a splash of shadow so yeah, these are going to be uh, just an upgraded unit of Night Runners. Essentially, they're going to do more damage. And I believe they have access to slings, although don't quite quote me on that. So we then have the Elite, the Storm Vermin. These powerful Skaven warriors have, have been raised from infancy to be the most deadly killers and soldiers in the entire Skaven horde. Storm Vermin would naturally be Blackford Skaven, the fur indicating them as the perfect warriors in society. They would also be naturally heavy armored given the best food and gear available to them and living much more luxurious lives than the ordinary clan rat. These troops are only committed into the front where the battle is turning bad for the Skaven, and the need for more hardened warriors are required to ensure victory. So we have the melee infantry out of the way, so now we can move on to ranged infantry, and first up we have the Poison Wind Globadiers. Now, similar in appearance to Warlock Engineers, and in some cases Engineers themselves, these Globadiers are one of the newest in Clan Skyr's biological weaponry. Using the deadly Poison Wind Globe, these Ratmen are trained to throw these vile glass orbs at the thickest of fightings, using the poison fumes to its fullest effect. So these are going to be, think of um, Naft Throwers from Attila, or even Medieval 2. They throw these, these orbs, and they break, and release gas, which is known as Poison Wind. And this is literally just, as it said, biological warfare. It's poison. It kills people. Um, you'll probably kill your own Skaven as well, <laughs> to be fair, if you throw it into melee. But, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's very effective, and it will kill lots of people, of course, because they breathe it in, and ah, they're dead. So we move on to the next ranged infantry, and that is the Warplock Gisales. When the need for a more precise shot is required by its paw leader, most clans would employ the use of a deadly Gisale team to pick off key individuals within an army. 
Giselles are a two Skaven team of highly trained snipers, employed for the use of assassinating important targets from an extremely long distance. The rifles, called Giselles, have the longest range of any other rifle in the old world, due in most part cause of the dangerous use of warp stone bullets as the main source of ammunition. So these are going to be basically assassination weapons. You can choose them to target monsters and big characters maybe. So they will be very effective on the battlefield. So our final ranged infantry are the weapons teams. Clan Skyrim makes use of specialized groups of Skaven engineers to handle and deploy weaponry into the front. These weapon teams will naturally be attached to other blocks of infantry to provide clan rats with much needed firepower. So they are separated into four weapons that being the warp fire thrower which is a flamethrower a rattling gun which is a multi blair uh, multi-barreled gatling gun essentially a poison wind mortar which is a weapon that fires the poison wind globes and a warp grinder which is essentially a tunneling device that you can push into enemy infantry so then we move on to monsters we have giant rats the most common and cheapest clan molder has to offer these creatures might at a distance look like normal rats but on closer inspections they have a variety of mutations, a staple of Clan Mulder's expertise. Standing bigger than the average dog, these rats have a variety of, creature, of features that only increase their effectiveness in combat. Such things include extra heads, oversized incisors or claws, spike tails, and even strong bony plate armor. The far more mutated ones have been have exposed ribs, massive boils, and even skinless flesh. Next up we have Rat Ogres, the most infamous of Clan Mulder's many creations. These beasts are one of the largest and most fearsome of their creations within their disposal. Larger than any human, these beasts stand taller than two men, and have enough strength and muscle to fight a whole company of soldiers. Rat Ogres are usually covered with stitches, as many times their Clan Mulder masters have, have added modifications to their already formidable bulk either adding large saw-like blades, weapon attachments, and even an extra arm to those few Skaven warlords willing to pay a few extra warp tokens. So then finally for monsters we have the Hell Pit Abomination, the greatest creation Clan Mulder hath ever created. This monstrosity towers any creation Clan Mulder has ever made in their long diabolic history. A massive beast standing taller than eight men, and many times stronger, this engine of destruction is unstoppable in the battlefield with not with many not even having the courage to even look at the hideous sight. So this is one of the greatest monsters we've seen, we've reviewed so far on this in this series. And oh boy, oh boy, from the pictures you guys are of course seeing, this thing is going to be absolutely terrifying to see on the battlefield. It's, it's going to be very interesting to see. So we then move on to artillery. So first we take a look at the Skaven artillery. So first off, we have the Plague Claw Catapult, which is literally a catapult that is used to fire just rotting stuff garbage and just it's basically just to spread disease around the battlefield to your enemies so that's going to be very interesting and the next one which is a bit more interesting is the warp lightning cannon it is the very pinnacle of skaven ingenuity a marvel of both magical and scientific engineering this machine has the power to fire a very concentrated blast of pure warp lightning at the very heart of an army so powerful and so potent that not even castle walls could hold against such an onslaught when fired the lightning would arc earthwards unto its victim and erupt into a cloud of warp lightning upon impact. The shot flash is too quick to follow, so only its vapor trail could trace the trajectory of the shot. We then move on to the war machines. So first we have the Skaven Bell. Of all the diabolic wonder weapons of the Skaven, none is as notorious as the altars known as the Screaming Bell. It is from these unholy altars that the Greyseers preach their plans of total domination in the name of the Great Horned Rat. With magical invocations, the bells can suck the courage out of the enemy in a single deafening bell toll. We then have the Plague Furnaces. The Plague Furnace is a disease-ridden altar to the Great Horned Rat and an unholy icon of the clan's power. The furnace is pushed into battle by chanting plague monks, the creaking of the iron-shod wheels audible above the drone of devotional maledictions. At first sight, the Doom Wheel may look less menacing and even comical compared to the other war machines of the Skaven, but those that have faced one in battle know full well of its prowess. The design of the machine is so simple and yet so complex, so utterly Skaven in its inception, that it's well beyond the understanding of even the top minds of the School of Engineers. So basically, just, in th in, uh, just to add on, the Screaming Bell is more of an anti-enemy unit, the Plague Furnace is more of a magic and buffing your own troops thing and the doom wheel acts sort of as a chariot and you can see that you would the, the skaven would just drive it into units uh, it has warp not guns but warp weapons on it ranged weapons that can of course fire at enemies as it goes by and yeah stuff like that so very interesting <laughs> the skaven definitely have some of the most interesting war machines in the game it's going to be very cool to see them of course and what they can do so as i mentioned earlier 
The two characters that I've decided to use as legendary lords for this list may not be suitable for you guys. Um, a lot of people might be better than Ick Claw, but I do believe Thankwell of all the Skaven would be the first legendary lord, so we'll talk about him. So arguably one of the most talented and masterful minds in the entire Under Empire, Thankwell is a gray seer of considerable power and influence, an expert in the dark arts of magic and a mastermind of subterfuge and deceit. Along with his title as Gracier, Thankwill is one of the Council of Thirteen's most favored messengers and ambassadors, representing the Council of Thirteen's wishes and demands on his numerous missions into different parts of the Under Empire. A Skaven of great cunning, Thankwill has been at the forefront of causing misery and mayhem to the enemies of the Skaven race, having been the very same Skaven that became the supreme commander of the Skaven force inv invading Nuln, the savior of the great clan Mulder city of Hellpit, the destroyer of the great city... Skaven City of Under Altdorf, the killer of the great Lizardman Prophet of Sotek, and the summoner of the great Cornate Bloodthirster Scarbrand. All of, of course, these are all end times things, so these won't really apply much to Total War Warhammer, but he is a very important character. Although his exploits were grandiose, and many, most of them have ended in near complete disaster. Due to his many enemies and that have thwarted his plan time and time again, sometimes his exploits were the result of his extreme incompetence and paranoia. As a reward for his somewhat successful missions, Thankwell has been rewarded a Rat Ogre by the Council, naming him Bone Ripper, a name he continues to use for every one of his Rat Ogre bodyguards. I believe there's been about 13 of them. <laughs> so he's going to have a mount as Bone Ripper, so that's going to be quite interesting to see, and you can see a picture of him, of course, right now. So then, for my second choice, we had Ikit Claw. Now, of course, like I said, you guys can have your opinion on what uh, lords you would like to see. Just be sure to... Uh, Tell me down below what you would like to see. But Ikiklaw is the tweet chief warlock engineer of Clan Skyr. He is considered by many to be the most promising warlock engineer of the entire clan. An expert mechanic and engineer, Claw has or Ikit rather, has taken Clan Skyr's mix of science and sorcery to new levels of complexity and depravity. Entire legions of Skaven slaves and warlock engineers have died as a price to pay for the creation and experimenting of Ikit's new arsenal of weaponry to be added to the clan's already powerful stock of weapons. He has traveled far and wide in search of newer and better ways to increase his vast knowledge to unparalleled portions. Such is his knowledge and influence that he came very close to creating and activating the very first atomic bomb, a device so destructive that many within the hierarchy fear those Skaven that possess such a formidable weapon. So yeah, these two, I feel, are the most influential, Ikit being the most powerful warlock engineer, and Thankful being the most powerful Gracier. Now, of course, we can have people like um, Queek, and all those other people that are warlords, and they could be very influential, but they just don't get as much praise as Ikit and Thankwell, so that's what I believe are the two that we will see first. Now, of course, there will be a bunch of others that could be added, and yeah. But guys, that is the end of the episode. This has actually almost been the longest one, if not maybe the longest one. So I thank you for watching. I thank you for sticking by. Um, it took me a long time to write this script because of... Or not the script, but the notes and stuff, so I'm a little drained, so sorry if that reflects in maybe some of the things I've said or related stuff. But yeah, I thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed as much as the other ones, and I hope to see you in the next episode. But until then, this has been Overkill as always, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.